good to uh, be at Leeds University doing this kind of thing, not only because I work here, but because the university's got a really strong popular music tradition, not just in the teaching realm. Um, most of you will know that The Who's Live at Leeds was recorded here, one of the greatest, if not the greatest, rock albums recorded live of all time. Um, and we have a string of other names, major names, from um, Mark Knopfler of Dire Straits, who attended the university, fantastic Corin Bailey Ray, who uh, was also an English undergraduate at Leeds. Um, the Gang of Four, great post-punk band of the early 1980s, they, most of them came here, some of the kinds of chiefs, so we've got these links with rock culture that um, are worth trumpeting, I think. And today we're going to touch upon some of those points as well. And I must say at the very start that I am a popular music specialist, I'm not a fine art expert, although I know a little bit about the subject, so uh, if there's anyone out there with fine art, art credentials, pick me up at any point you like to tell me where I might be getting it wrong. But, uh, okay, so that's the title of the piece, and just to say a few words about what we're going to try and cover in the next three quarters of an hour or so. Um, I'd like to say a little bit about this Peter Blake and Leeds University relationship. Liz has touched upon it already a little and we'll unfold a few more layers in respect of that. I'd like to say a little bit about Blake himself, um, long-standing figure in the British art establishment, but just remind you of uh, who this man actually is. We'll say a little bit about pop art too, because there's an interesting link clearly between Blake as an artist and the Beatles as the most important um, popular music ensemble of the 20th century, I think we, we, we could claim. We'll say a little bit about the making of the sleeve. Also, briefly touch upon Pablo Franke and his uh, connection to this whole story. And towards the end, we'll think a little bit about the approaching 80th birthday of Peter Blake and uh, illustrate that in quite an interesting way. So this is what we're going to be talking about. So I hope some of it, if not all of it, may be of interest to some of you, if not all of you. So Peter Blake in Leeds University. Um, not, I suppose, a sort of natural connection, but quite a good friendship has been forged between this painter and the School of Music during the last seven years or so. In 2005, we established a Peter Blake art gallery within the School of Music. Um, and as Liz has said, the, the second half of this exercise is that we go over and look at the images that uh, Peter Blake has made available to us. Um, and I think you'd be impressed by what you see. In 2006, The Who returned to Leeds to play a major live concert, some decades after their Live at Leeds recording. And we'll say a little bit about that too, because Peter Blake is part of that story as well. And in 2011, just over a year ago, Peter Blake was awarded an honorary doctorate by Leeds University. And so we further forged a connection with this painter. But let's start out by saying a few words about the gallery. It was opened in February 2005, and we have a picture here of Peter Blake at the opening in front of his uh, most famous album sleeve, at least, the one we're going to talk about quite a bit today, the Sergeant Pepper sleeve. Um, Peter Blake came along and opened the proceedings. It's great to have along with the guests. And various individuals connected with this occasion, but that may be just worth mentioning who, who, who they are. We have Peter Blake in the middle here. We have Michael Arthur, who's the uh, Vice Chancellor of Leeds University. Um, this is Bill Nelson. Does anyone in the audience know who Bill Nelson is? A guitar. Bebop Deluxe, absolutely right. Bill Nelson, fabulous guitarist of the 70s and beyond. Bill is also a good friend of ours as, as a department. Um, who else is on the picture? This, this, this don't worry, don't worry at all. Here's a chap worth mentioning, Pete Smith. Pete Smith is Peter Blake's 
art publisher. He publishes prints for Peter Blake. And it was essentially Pete Smith who had been um, a concert secretary at Leeds University Student Union in the early 1970s who made the collection that we will see later available to us. So Pete, this happens to be Pete's son, this is me, this is David Cooper who was the head of the School of Music at the time. So just a few of the personalities who attended on that day. Of course at the centre Peter Blake was the star guest, it was all about him really. And just a couple of images just to illustrate this process in action. We uh, uh, gathered around 20 pieces before we mounted the exhibition and these images were really just um, taken as we're preparing to, to mount the show. And in fact on the day, February the 10th, 2005, rather hard to see this image here in the lights, but quite a crowd gathered to uh, toast the occasion. So we have uh, the Peter Blake Art Gallery, which in the next hour or so we'll have a look at close up. But we also mentioned the the Who. The Who returned to Leeds in 2006. Quite a few interesting bits of background to this in the sense that Michael Arthur Vice Chancellor of the University, who happens to be a big Rolling Stones fan, as it, as it happens, but he also loves the Who, um, have been chatting to a chap who has become a little more notorious in recent times than celebrated, but I think Andy Kershaw, well that's of whom we speak, Andy Kershaw, I think he's back on uh, safe tracks again, and Andy, talking to Michael Arthur, managed to uh, um, discuss a project by which the Who would return to play Leeds again. And in, in 2006, they, they did indeed do that. Thus emulating um, a project from 1970 when Live at Leeds had been recorded in the University Refectory, one of the great rock venues in the north of England, if not the country. And as part of this exercise, Peter Blake agreed to design a new image to celebrate the Who's return. And so when the band came, Townsend and Daltrey, Pete Townsend and Roger Daltrey, the two surviving members of the, the famous four piece who continue to appear as the Who from time to time, and Andy Kershaw, who was another social secretary of Leeds University at, at the end of the 1970s, they all turned up to take part in the, in the commemoration. And we have an image here in the top right hand corner, Roger Daltrey, uh, quite casually attired, I think you'll agree. Looks like he's just gone off the tennis court, but uh, he is applauding as Peter Blake unveils Live at Leeds 2. I think the plan was originally that the, the image might form an album sleeve. Nothing has actually transpired from that project as far as I know so far, but it may do in the future. And of course on the right, um, the windmill, arm wheeling uh, guitarist Pete Townsend, um, the other most famous surviving member of the band. And on the same day, the same day that these uh, events were occurring in 2006, the University Refectory also unveiled one of those famous historic blue plaques. You can see it here between Townsend and Daltrey. A plaque which commemorated the fact that back in, I think it was February the 14th, 1970, I think it was Valentine's Day, back in 1970, the Who came here and recorded this uh, groundbreaking live album. Um, well, so, so, yeah, most certainly, at, at any point. Where is the, the, the plaque is on the refectory, it's outside the refectory. Can anyone confirm that? It's certainly been there. Has, has it walked? Has anyone seen it lately? It is there. It's on the refectory. Absolutely. And there's, there's, there's an interesting sort of side um, story to this in that the, the Who also recorded their concert at Hull either the following night or the previous night. And the plan had been to uh, record the Hull concert for, uh, for posterity. But for some reason the recording equipment didn't work at that venue, and so they had to use the Leeds recording. So it's rather fortuitous for those uh, who like alliteration, live at Leeds rather than something at Hull or whatever, live at Leeds, 
uh, became the famous album. And uh, you should be able to see that too today if you, you want to. It's only sort of you know, 100 yards or, or so away. So the Who returning in 2006 was quite an interesting event in itself. And Peter Blake was here to unveil an artwork in relation to that. But in March 2011, we further advanced our link to, to Blake the Artist because on that date, Peter Blake was awarded an honorary degree by Leeds University. Um, he was awarded a Dean Mus, a Doctor of Music. And if you look at the list of people who have been awarded Dean Muzzets by Leeds University. It, it's quite extraordinary. Uh, let me think of at least a few who've come along and done it. Julian Breen, um, Gustav Holst, Jacqueline Dupre. The list is absolutely glittering when it comes to the musical um, recipients of that award. And the curious thing, of course, for Blake to receive a Dean Muzz is that he's not a musician but he's become so closely tied to the world of music making, certainly popular music making, that a decision was made to include him in this quite illustrious pantheon. Uh, a fantastic range of people who have uh, been awarded Dean Muzz's by, by Leeds. So, we've wandered a little bit through some of the connections that Blake has had directly with Leeds University in the last five or six years. I'd just like to say a few words now about Peter Blake. Some of you will know a good deal about this artist, others will know less, but let me just share a few personal details in relation to, to this particular painter. Born in Dartford, Kent in 1932, and as I hinted at the very start, he's going to be 80 in 2012. So quite an important landmark for Blake up and coming. He attended the Royal College of Art. And by the start of the 1960s, it had become closely linked to this new rising movement called pop art, which had had its seed so both in the US and also in the UK might be argued that British pop art emerged before American pop art. Which is quite an interesting development when we consider in the 1950s and early 60s America was the great sort of thrusting nation of change and novelty. But Britain, in the more austere 50s, was starting to develop its own pop art culture. And I think it's also worth stressing, although we're going to talk about pop art, that Peter Blake is so much more than just a painter of those pop-connected images. He's a remarkably wide-ranging creator, as painter, printmaker, as <coughs> book illustrator, as creator of installations or furniture or sculptures. And he draws very heavily, not just on jazz and rock and pop culture, and he's very interested, and this probably connects more closely to some of the circus ideas that you were dealing with last night. He's very interested in that kind of folk art that has come out of the fairgrounds, from the world of the canal, the sort of posters that advertise wrestling shows. Blake is always very interested in that sort of folk art, and he's woven much of it into his, into his creations. But in the early 60s, it was really the pop art boom that put Blake on the map. In 1962, a very significant British director, died not too long ago, Ken Russell, created a film called Pop Goes the Weasel, in which he looked at four young British artists who were breaking ground in this pop style. And Blake was a little older than the others in the film. 
probably find this on YouTube these days, but uh, Blake was a little bit old and was regarded as the sort of elder statesman of this new style that rejected painterly abstraction and instead started to tap into more familiar symbols and emblems from music, from cinema, from television, from the, the supermarket shelf. And we'll say a little bit more about that in due course. But Pop Goes the Weasel was an important TV film shown on the BBC and Blake had a large audience for this new work he was doing. In the same year too, the Sunday Times colour supplement was launched and Peter Blake and a lot of those new young talents in Britain, the fashion designers, the artists, the photographers who were starting to make a mark, even before the Beatles exploded luminously, were featured in this magazine. And for Blake, this was a great platform. It trumpeted this new wave of talent, and Blake was seen as one of the great talents within that range of new arrivals. So pop art. Let's just say a few words about pop art. Are there fans of pop art in the room? Do people, quite a few pop art fans, okay. So you're probably as familiar with some of the things we're going to look at um, as I am. But uh, I think it's worth saying that by the middle of the 20th century, the dominating force within world art was the city of New York. And within that city, a number of artists were taking abstract creativity to its ultimate destination. Abstract expressionism completely deconstructed what you might cons consider to be uh, the representational or the figurative and went for these abstract canvases. A number of figures including Jackson Pollock here, Jackson Pollock most famously a painting simply called Number Eight in which Pollock would drip or throw or cast paint across a canvas to create these very interesting but utterly abstract forms. Um, in fact, he got the nickname Jack the Dripper, which is you know, quite, quite a curious thing in itself, but Jackson Pollock used to drip his paints onto the canvas. And then a new wave of artists who wanted to reject abstraction and instead use recognisable features on the canvas. Reacted to this abstraction and among them were Richard Hamilton, another British artist, who by around 5354 was talking to the Italian Scottish artist Eduardo Palozzi and they were talking about incorporating symbols of modernity, of mass culture, into their work. They wanted to say goodbye to this overthought or cerebral work, and they wanted to make a more accessible product, which commented on the new post-war world. And Hamilton's most famous image, Richard Hamilton too died towards the end of 2011, Hamilton created this particular work in, I think, 1956. Indeed, 1956. This is a, a piece called Just What Is It That Makes Today's Home So Different, So Appealing. And in many ways, it was a kind of send-up or a lampoon on a new wave of advertising that was occurring. Um, I guess people like Terence Conran were starting to arrive with Habitat, were starting to become concerned about the way our homes looked in the post-war scene. And Hamilton is rather ironically commenting on this phenomenon in 1956. So, in many ways, British artists like Hamilton, Paolozzi, and then Blake a little later, are using collage, or cutting images out of magazines, or taking stills from... Um, television or from pop um, photographs and creating these new rather satirical commentaries on the modern world. In America a little later, a painter like Roy Lichtenstein 
1963, he's painting simply called Wham, which takes a frame from an American comic book, pixelates it in large-scale form, turns it into a canvas which I think is quite a bit bigger than the painting we see here, takes one frame from a comic book and turns it into, into, into art. And so in America and in the UK too, Artists are starting to think similar thoughts. And Peter Blake is quickly part of this, this movement. By the early 60s, he's making paintings that are catching people's eyes. One of his most famous images from 1961 is self-portrait with badges. You can see the same figure we saw a few slides back. Uh, a little whiter of hair, a little whiter of beard, a little paunchier, but this is him in 1961 as a younger man. And if we look at this particular image, we see that Blake is adopting quite a few signs of the 50s, the early 60s of modernity. He's holding an Elvis fan magazine. This is Elvis Presley, a large badge on his chest. Um, he's also wearing blue denim which for, I guess, any Brit to be wearing in 61 was quite radical, quite unusual. A denim jacket, denim jeans, and he's got also on his feet baseball boots. So he's, he, he's suggesting that you know, America is perhaps his, his inspiration, his model, and certainly the new rock and roll. Presley's come along in 55, 56, and he's a huge Presley fan. He's showing it in this particular, this particular image. Another picture from a similar period, an image called Got a Girl, in which he takes geometric shapes. Blake often uses geometric shapes. They, they, they perhaps echo the flag, or they echo uh, bullseyes or targets. But he adds to this particular canvas an early single that he's perhaps bought on Capitol uh, Records. We have Ricky Nelson here, we have Elvis Presley here, we have the solo boy singers who in the early 1960s are exciting the pop world. This is pre-Beatles and Blake is listening to these people as he paints and creates works like this. So in the early 60s Blake is already starting to follow the pop, the pop model. But in terms of making a breakthrough, as an artist who's known beyond artistic circles, this particular project was the one that was going to spread his name and his talent globally. It's, it's, it's quite interesting to note, just before we talk about Sergeant Pepper, that in the early 1960s, as Warhol, as Andy Warhol was starting to make his mark in, in New York, and indeed on the west coast of America, Blake took a show to New York. This was around 1962. And Blake was criticised for just aping the styles and approaches of the new American artists like Lichtenstein and Jasper Johns and Andy Warhol. But in fact, Blake had been doing this before, along with several of the British artists we've mentioned. The British were actually trailblazers in this field. And this experience for Blake proved quite sour. He not only felt the, the acerbic taste of American criticism, but the critics were writing the wrong things about what he was doing. They should have seen him as the innovator rather than the new American artist. But in 1967, Blake, as I say, by taking on this commission, would achieve a global reputation because of the Beatles' huge status, huge stature. This year he was invited by the Beatles and their management to create the Sergeant Pepper Sleeve. In fact, he was invited with his then wife, Jan Howarth. He married Jan Howarth in 1963, and they did quite a lot of work together in the 60s and into the 70s. They were married until 1979. And Jan Howarth is less remembered 
maybe a typical story of a, of, of a woman who's played a part in an important art project like this being uh, sidelined. So there's no doubt at all that Blake benefited most in terms of the reputation he achieved from this venture. Howarth and Blake decided that they were going to create a gathering, a crowd, a lineup, it was almost like a school photograph of the Beatles' heroes. They created a three dimensional installation in which faces, heads, upper torsos were placed on wooden or uh, cardboard stands laid out in a room. And a photographer called Michael Cooper actually photographed the images that would make the centerpiece for the sleeve. And of course this was the remarkable result of their collaboration. And in fact, before we just say a little bit more about this, because I think it's worth talking through a little bit further, for those of you who are younger than others, probably the vinyl sleeve for Sergeant Pepper is worth a look. That's after we finish the talk. Anyone who would like to look at this is very welcome to do so. This was the very first album that I ever bought. This is the actual album, and, it, and it's worth pointing out too that it was a gatefold sleeve, which was quite radical at the time, in fact, you know, groundbreaking itself. Even more significant was that the Beatles included all their lyrics on the sleeve. Until this point, you know, pop lyrics had been regarded as throwaway, ephemeral, and of, of no consequence. Here was a clear indication that people wanted to read the lyrics, sing the lyrics, maybe treat the lyrics as something more than just pop words. Also worth mentioning, I guess, is that the cardboard cutout that Peter Blake also designed and was inserted in the gatefold, um, a number of cutout items there that you could uh, use scissors on if you wanted to, you could put on the sergeant's braid and so on. Uh, and I think there are very few of these actually still in existence in this uncut out shape. So if you, as I said, if you want to look at that a little bit later, you're very welcome to. And while we're at it, we're listening to the, to the CD at the very start, before we started the talk, and everyone will, will be familiar with the look of a CD, a fairly rare item, an actual cassette of Sergeant Pepper. Um, clearly the, uh, the image that Blake and Howe designed certainly works rather poorly on there, works much better on here. Um, on the CD, it's less effective perhaps because it's scary. But, uh, you know, so a, a few things that you might just want to look at before we uh, go over to the gallery. But here, here is this amazing image. Um, I've described it as the Mona Lisa of rock and roll simply because I think it's hard to argue that it's not the most recognisable, most important image to come out of rock album art at least. Um, as recognisable as the Mona Lisa would argue. Um, the Beatles were invited to choose their heroes to appear on, 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 the, uh, on the sleeve. Um, Ringo Starr said he'd leave it to the other three to decide, so I don't think Ringo had any direct input to the process. George Harrison decided to nominate uh, yogis and maharishis from uh, uh, Asian religious culture because of his, his interest in that world, but principally Lennon and McCartney chose their, chose their heroes. And uh, who have we got? Well, we've got Bob Dylan, significantly. We have Karl Heinz Stockhausen, Laurel and Hardy in there, Marlon Brando. Are there others anyone in the room can spot or want to point out? Anyone else you recognise? Sorry, sorry, Jenny. Looks like Tony Hancock, or is it fourth from the left on the back? I don't think it is. I don't think it is. It's, 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 a, it's a good guess, though. It's, that's not Tony Hancock. I'm not too sure who that is. But th th this is actually, someone said Muhammad Ali, that's actually Sonny Liston, who was the, the boxer that Cassius Clay defeated 
in combat in 64, 65 to become world champion. Um, the Beatles in their earlier phase, their mop top phase, um, a reference here to the Rolling Stones, I think it says the Rolling Stones we love you or something very close to that on, on the jumper here. Down the doors, is it? Is it down the doors or is it Jane Mansfield? But, it, but it's, it's certainly one of those iconic blondes, isn't it? Who, 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 who. I think it's Jane Mansfield. But um, there are certainly, not necessarily hours, but half hours of fun looking at this particular image to see who, who is featured there. And uh, one or two people didn't make the final cut. Um, Mahatma Gandhi was meant to be featured on the sleeve, but it was felt late in the day EMI decided that uh, placing this near political deity within the, the gathering might insult um, their Indian South Asian uh, potential customers. So Gandhi didn't appear. And even more curious, if, if you look at the, the images as they're setting up the shoot in 1967, behind, behind Lennon, I think, that's Bob Hope there, but behind Lennon, we can't see this person, is Adolf Hitler. Adolf Hitler is in the crowd. And I suppose typical of John Lennon's mischievous, subversive nature, he, he wanted to include Hitler in the cast. I think if he had done, there would have been an extraordinary response to that. But Hitler is in this crowd, but he's behind one of the Beatles. So, uh, quite lucky, I think, in some ways, that they decided to obscure this particular individual. So the Sergeant Pepper sleeve, we'll see this in, a, in an interesting form in the, in the gallery when we pop over there. Extraordinarily, Blake and Howard received a £200 fee for this exercise. £200 in 1967 was quite a lot of money, but compared to the, the cash, the kudos, the commercial clout that this particular project had, £200 was just an insult to the artists who, who worked on it. And Blake spent a number of decades after this process, feeling quite resentful to the Beatles camp for riding on this extraordinary image but not giving him any proper return for his creativity or, or, or his efforts. Um, the sleeve actually cost £3,000 to create. Now this was massive money in 1967. In 1967 Record companies allocated about £25 for a sleeve to be created. They told the photographer to take a picture of Matt Monroe or Engelbert Humperdinck or whoever it was, Sandy Shaw or Lulu. £25, take a photograph, we'll snap it on the cover. The Beatles had a bill for a hundred times bigger than record companies were used to. Around £40,000 in present day prices would have been spent on this, this one image. So uh, it puts into contemporary context. And as I say here, uh, Blake and I guess Howard too have felt a certain resentment that they've achieved what they've achieved for the Beatles, for this project, and, and never really got their, their just rewards. It's also quite interesting to think about where the pieces are from this three-dimensional installation that was created on over a few days in a studio in London. Um, the Sunny Liston waxwork, which we see on the left, we were just pointing uh, to it a few, few months ago. The Sunny Liston waxwork is in Peter Blake's studio in London. He still has it as a sort of icon that stands over him as he paints and collages and so on. Um, there were two bass drum skins created for the image um, in that sort of fairground art style which, which echo some of the points I was making about Blake's interests a little while ago. Um, in a rather poignant way, um, the last time one of those two skins was seen was in photographs taken at John Lennon's Dakota apartment in the days before he was, was murdered. And uh, no one's absolutely sure now where that skin has gone. Um, 
Not 100% sure whether it's the skin that appeared on the image or it's the spare, but uh, it's gone astray now. I suppose with any kind of art, and you know, if you think about the Mona Lisa and uh, uh, surrealists or a Dadaist like Marcel Duchamp taking on an image like that and recreating it, a great image, a striking image, is always going to attract both homages and lampoons. And it wasn't long before that great subversive, that great satirist of late 60s rock music, Frank Zappa, was sending up the Beatles' sleeve in an album released by the Mothers of Invention called We're Only In It For The Money, which uh, I suppose was Zappa's barbed retort to the Beatles who are now multi-multi-millionaires and uh, I think Zappa felt as if it was rather, uh, the whole process had been rather tainted by cash. A bit further down the line, in 1998, our great friends The Simpsons created a collection of songs from the show and called it The Yellow Album. I suppose a tribute both to, to the submarine and also the facial colour of the characters. But here are The Simpsons in Sergeant Pepper mode on an album scene from 1998. Okay, so to move on a little bit. Sergeant Pepper and Pablo Fanke, we mentioned this individual at the start. And I was quite shocked six, seven years ago to discover that this fascinating mid-century Victorian circus proprietor was buried in the grounds of Leeds University. Pablo Fanke, you will see, was a black man, a black businessman, um, said to be, during that period, the only black circus proprietor in Britain. And he ran a successful show for many, many years. Fanke is mentioned in one of the Sergeant Pepper songs, Being for the Benefit of Mr. Kite. This song that ends, I think, side one of the, the vinyl album, at least, uh, where Lennon decided to take the words from... Um, a fair bill, a poster announcing all the artists who are going to appear in a particular mid-Victorian circus show. And Pablo Fanke is mentioned in that, in that song. Mentioned on the bill, mentioned in the song. And in 2007, 40 years after Sgt. Pepper had been released, um, I organised a conference called A Day in the Life celebrating those four decades since the release. And delegates came from all over the world to talk about the music, the sleeve, the culture, the Beatles. And we all, towards the end of that day, paid a visit to Pablo Fanke's grave um, in St. George's Field, which, if you're not that familiar with the university, is, is, is a field, a grassy spread, which is located behind some of the buildings we're very close to. In fact, it's just over there, isn't it, in that direction. Um, and we see here Derek Scott, Professor Derek Scott, who is the current head of the School of Music at Leeds, with one of the great, one of the eminent heavy, music, heavy metal experts in the world, Dina Weinstein, standing in front of him, and they're looking at the Pablo Fanke Gray. Okay, so we're moving towards the end, but let's finish with a few thoughts about what we're going to see next. Pop art became very much linked to the album sleeve of the 1960s, certainly after Blake had done his work for, for the Beatles. And there are a few other examples worth mentioning. In fact, just predating Sgt. Pepper was the Velvet Underground's debut album in 1967 which features Warhol's ripening or unpeeling banana. And in 1968, to go back to Richard Hamilton, there was a, a, a very interesting uh, response to the rich sort of technicolour baroque qualities of this sleeve when Hamilton, for the next Beatles album, created a sleeve that was all white. And while the album was called The Beatles, 
the recording, this double album recording, was quickly dubbed the White Album because of the very sleeve that uh, Hamilton had created. And I think Hamilton was, was paying tribute to other 20th century artists who'd also been interested <coughs> in creating all white artworks. Um, during the First World War, a, a Russian called Kazimir Malevich had created a series of white paintings, all white paintings. And in the early 1950s, someone who would be influential on the pop art, art, art movement, Robert Rauschenberg, would also create a series of, uh, of white paintings uh, which um, were part of the Black Mountain College experiment in, in the US uh, alongside John Cage, Merce Cunningham and others. An American pop artist called Jim Dine would do a sleeve for the great British rock trio Cream. When their greatest hits came out in 1969, he created the sleeve. And in 1971, <coughs> Andy Warhol produced a sleeve for the Rolling Stones' Sticky Fingers. So there was this, this growing connection in the later 60s and early 70s between pop artists and important rock groups. <coughs> Blake Sergeant Pepper opened the door to all sorts of other opportunities and over the next few decades Blake would, would do many of these commissions. He did work for Brian Wilson, Eric Clapton, Robbie Williams, Oasis, all of these we'll see in the very near future. He created some amazing work for Band Aid and Live Aid in 1984 and 1985. And as I say we'll see those in the very near future. In 2002, Peter Blake was knighted for his services to art. He's been served with Peter Blake for the last decade. And as he moves towards his 80th birthday, Blake has decided to do a kind of self-reflexive homage to his own 1967 work. He's decided to create his own Mona Lisa, a personalised edition of the Mona Lisa of rock and roll. He's taken 79 friends, inspirations, family members, and so on, and gathered them in a similar Sergeant Pepper style. And this particular work, although it's been widely seen in the press in the last few weeks, will be formally released when he celebrates his birthday in June. And this seems like quite an appropriate way to end today's talk by just briefly thinking about the kind of image that is celebrating his own life, another Sergeant Pepper style affair in which once again his influences or his inspirations are, are to the fore. Figures like Eric Clapton, David Hockney, another person linked to the world of, of pop art, <coughs> one of the Gallagher brothers, Alexander McQueen, Damien Hirst, Twiggy, David Bowie, Perhaps leave that up there for us to uh, just muse on as we come to the end of this, uh, this presentation. But, uh